Hello, everyone. Um, thank you guys for coming today. Uh, we have a real treat. Um, so today I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Uh, Chris, uh, Cristina Castillo Cobo. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Castillo began her with a BS and MS in economics at De La Salle University in Manila, in Manila Philippines, and a first year PhD in economic and quantitative analysis at the Universidad Complutense in Madrid, Spain. <clears throat> Later in her career, Dr. Castillo-Cobo uh, completed uh, an MA in the History of Art and Archaeology of Southeast Asia at the School of Oriental and African Studies, uh, SOAS, University of London, and then a PhD in Archaeology at the Institute of Archaeology, University College London. Her dissertation was titled The Archaeobotany of Kao Sam Keo and Pu Kao Tong, The Agriculture of Late Prehistoric Southern Thailand, and since then, she has co-authored and published over 31 peer-reviewed articles in international journals, 10 as first author, and 17 book chapters, eight as first author. So I'm sure she has a lot to tell us about all of this in her talk today. So please, uh, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Christina Castillo-Cobo. Thank you. I'm now going to share my screen. So bear with me for one second. Okay. Can everyone see that? Looks great. Okay. So... Um, for some reason, I'm seeing things. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you very much for inviting me today. My name is Cristina Castillo, and I am going to talk about my experience or the research that I have been conducting over the past 15 years in mainland Southeast Asia. Um, and the specialization that I use is archaeobot archaeobotany. And actually, instead of saying, what have we learned so far? I could probably say, what have I learned? Because it has been, oops, hold on. Okay, there you go. So um, my presentation will be uh, in three parts. Part one, which is a short background of archaeobotany. I realize the audience may be comprised mostly of anthropologists, but perhaps a bit of a refresher on this archaeological specialization may help situate the talk. Um, archaeobotany will be a few slides on what it is, the limitations, um, and how we manage these limitations in tropical climates, such as the ones we have in Southeast Asia. Research in Southeast Asia is basically a, a slide about uh, where I have worked in the past 15 years. And finally, the aims uh, of what we hope to answer when we use archaeobotanical investigations. Part two is um, the key findings. I put rice because for the past six years to eight years since I've been doing uh, postdoctoral uh, work, I have concentrated most of my time to working on rice and therefore rice is a very important um, crop for me. And therefore I will talk about uh, my collaborative work that I have done at UCL, the Institute of Archaeology, uh, where we try to disentangle the origins and domestication of rice. I will also um, give a case study um, in Northeast Thailand, which shows an agricultural transition from dryland to wetland rice cultivation that happened during a period of increasing social complexity and uh, aridification. Um, lastly, it would, I would provide some implications of what this means. And part three um, is uh, basically the key findings of work that I've been conducting in recently, more recently with collaborators again in Cambodia um, of the Khmer Empire. And I put rice plus because it goes beyond rice. Rice is very important. And of course, it's very important in the Khmer Empire as well. But there are more things than just rice. So the first part, I would talk about the Angkorian research. Uh, and then I will delve into another case study um, which provides information about the non-elites and urban horticulture. And finally, conclusions which provide um, what the archaeobotanical contribution has been um, in the Angkorian research world. So some background information 
you can see a few slides here which show how archaeobotany is conducted in the field. So it always starts with field archaeology, where we gather soil samples that um, to collect to collect the, the, the soil samples, you have to, to still dig holes. Then you provide the archaeobotanist, me, with a lot of soils, which you can see in those bags that are collected in one area. Those are all sam soil samples, which I would later on float using the simple bucket flotation. It's a slide taken from um, my work in Banon Wat. And then as long as you have a lot of water and some help, it is quite easy to do flotation in Southeast Asia. Now, what is archaeobotany? Archaeobotany, I uh, call a bottom-up specialization because, like I said, you start with the collection of soils and then you process these soils with water and eventually you bring it to the lab and you um, sort and identify and then analyze your results. So, what is um, this? What is archaeobotany? It is the study of plant remains, which in Europe we, we call archaeobotany, and in the US you normally refer to as paleoethnobotany. Um, normally, paleoethnobotany is referred to as the, um, the focus on archaeological interpretation of the relationships between people and plants, and archaeobotany is the recovery of those botanical uh, remains and the identifications, but in Europe, we use archaeobotany to mean the same thing. So we can use those plant remains for other things eventually, such as ancient DNA, isotope analyses. I think people coming in is making it, okay. Residue analyses, as well as radiocarbon dating. Um, the archaeobotany, the archaeological investigations in Southeast Asia are normally thought to be limited because of the belief that preservation is an issue in tropical climates. This is true. It is an issue. Um, however, there are ways around it, and I will uh, go back to that in, in just a while. Um, and so phytoliths were instead being recommended, especially with the work that was conducted in the neotropics, which showed that mac macro remains analysis did not yield much information on agriculture and plant use. However, in the past 15 years that I have been working as an archaeobotanist in Southeast Asia, um, where it's very, very humid and very hot, we, I have been using um, the retrieval of botanical macro remains with some success. And this is in many sites across Southeast Asia, at least 30 sites. Um, in fact, charred plant remains or macro remains is what we normally get in Southeast Asia. And I've only come across one context which was desiccated and a few which were waterlogged. The rest have all been charred. And yes, there are limitations. For example, high bioturbation in tropical climates, which is caused by roots um, from trees and movements of soils by humans, will affect your, um, your context uh, in, in the interpretation of your uh, macro remains. Also, the conditions wherein you've got dry weather followed by wet, followed again by dry, will cause the macro remains to fragment. Um, and phytoliths also have limitations wherein very wet or strongly alkaline soils deteriorate phytoliths. So even though phytoliths are robust and inorganic, and you find them all in, in pretty much the soils, you can still have a problem with phytolith, uh, phytolith remains. And finally, ancient DNA, which has been uh, one of the sciences which we've been trying to get um, ancient DNA from plant remains, is still very much in its infancy and very difficult to get um, DNA amplification from plant remains, though there has been some limited success. So the bigger issues um, in archaeobotany is how to deal with these limitations, and it depends on the methodologies we use. So one of the things that I always say is you need to increase bulk soil sample volume. And the reason for this, and the reason, reason for this is that if you increase your sample size, you will also increase the number of identified specimens. 
Um, in her MA thesis at UCL, Katie Miller showed that an increase in the, in the amount of soil collected also increased the number of identified specimens. So in fact, whilst, you're, whilst uh, doing my dissertation, I collected somewhere around 40 liters of soil per context in every, in every, um, in every trench that was opened and for every context. Another thing that we should not forget is that we should also collect um, other um, archaeobotanical samples, such as phytoliths, because phytoliths is a complementary methodology to macro remains, which allow us to have different kinds of information. And of course, bucket um, flotation and wet sieving should also be done. Uh, so wet sieving should also be done in connection to bucket flotation. And here we've got very nice images. One is Logak, Vietnam, wherein we have a very nice um, uh, area for to do flotation and wet sieving. And then on the right hand side on top, another picture from the Philippines in Katanawan, where we were doing uh, flotation in the beach. Small mesh perforations are necessary. Um, I normally use 250 micron sieves in order to capture very, very small weed seeds that normally are associated with rice cultivation. Without these weed seeds, it's very difficult to talk about cultivation systems. And it provides more interesting results than just saying we found rice. Um, and likewise, sorting and identification is normally done um, up to 0.25 to 0.5 millimeter fractions, because that is where you find the weeds of cultivation, um, as well as the rice spikelet bases, which are very informative in telling us whether rice is domesticated or, or wild. And finally, it's extremely important to make sure that we know about the context security of the samples we're working with. So bioturbation is examined by looking at the amount of uh, modern contaminants. And in my samples, I get a lot of roots and modern seeds. So as long as we're aware of what the context security is, we can actually make better judgments of our interpretations. And the research that I have conducted in Southeast Asia has mostly been in mainland Southeast Asia, although I've also worked in three sites in island Southeast Asia. In this talk, I will be concentrating really on mainland Southeast Asia. Most of my work has been in Thailand, but I have to say that Vietnam and Cambodia are now catching up with the number of archaeobotanical investigations that um, have been going on in these countries. And this is very good news because that gives us a bigger picture of what the, um, what are, what the um, rice evolution would have been in, in Southeast Asia, as well as cultivation of other plants. So I've got a few examples of the places that I've worked in. So Non Banjak, which is a late Iron Age site. Um, it's a cemetery, but it's also um, residential area. Um, Banon Wat, uh, which illustrates here a uh, probably a pen where buffalo prints were found. Um, Khao Sam Keo on the corner on the left-hand side, which basically shows the one of the many one of the four mountains um, or hills of Khao Sam Keo, which is a metal age site. Uh, Logak, which is situated in southern Vietnam. And finally, a hunter gatherer site called Rak Nui, also in the southern part of Vietnam. And what do we aim to address when we do archaeobotanical studies? Well, archaeobotanical results provide a deep understanding of the emergence of, sorry, of the emergence of cereal agriculture in Southeast Asia. It also reconstructs diets in prehistoric and historic periods. Um, it gives us ecological reconstructions of the area, as well as what kind of cultivation systems were in place or farming systems, and the adaptation of people to changing climatic conditions. Uh, over and on top of that, it also gives us evidence of movements of people and resources. In particular, in my case, I study plants, exchange networks, um, craft production, and environmental challenges that people faced. 
So in part two, um, I will provide some key findings, um, specifically revolving around rice. A lot of work, like I said, during my postdocs has gone into the study of rice, including the postdoc that I did in Kobe University, um, uh, working, and I've got a slide in the, um, one of the pictures on the lower left-hand side, wherein I conducted experiments of harvest experiments of wild rice that was intergressed with um, domesticated genes of, um, of, mo of modern domesticated rice. Um, and I have to say now that the work that I have done would have never been possible with the, um, without the collaboration of many, many scholars around the world. So why rice? Well, rice is very important. It feeds more than half of the world's population and is especially important in Southeast Asia. Rice together with wheat and maize are the three leading food crops in the world. And together they directly feed around 42% of the calories of the entire human population. It is a, an important crop used in ritual, even up to now in Southeast Asia and has a lot of spiritual meaning. It has also been the base that supports higher populations. Um, it also underpins um, urbanism and states. And finally, um, in this day and age, when we talk about climate change, we definitely know that there is a role that rice um, uh, had in or played in global warming because wet rice produces methane. Although I won't be talking about that in this particular talk. Now, rice has a very complex history. So up until now, we used to refer to two subspecies of Asian rice as Indica and Japonica. But now with all the genetic studies that have been conducted on, especially on, on modern rice, we now refer to three subspecies, which includes Aush. It's a, a type of rice, which mainly is found in Bangladesh um, and some parts of Myanmar. Um, Japonica rice, uh, rices, which I think all of you are familiar with, especially if you like eating sushi, it's the rice you normally find in your sushi. Um, on the other hand, indica rices are the ones that you typically find nowadays in lowland Southeast Asia, um, in mainland Southeast Asia, like in Thailand. And of course, we have other rices that we don't consider here because we also have African rice, glabarima. So it has, um, there is a complexity of Asian rice when it comes to the uh, three main lineages, but also when it comes to the many ecologies of how rice can be grown. So um, rice is complex because of the ecologies where you can grow, where you can grow it. They can grow within a spectrum of wetness from very dry, um, dryland, rain-fed uh, Sweden systems which you have an example here um, on the left-hand side. This is a shot I took in Mei Hong Song when we visited um, White Karen village and they were in, in the process of winnowing the rice. And you can see in the background that it was Sweden cultivation. Or you can have um, irrigated rice uh, and even floating rice, which you get in the Ton Le Sap, for example, in Cambodia. Um, but here I have an example of upland irrigated uh, rice taken from um, a picture taken in Batad, which is where the amphitheater, the famous amphitheater rice terraces of the Philippines are found in North Philippines. Oh, sorry, that was just to show you the floating rice in the Tonle Sap. Now, I was involved in a collaborative project called the Early Rice Project together with um, Dorian Fuller, Fabio Sil Silva, and Alison Weisskopf. And we were interested in looking at the origins of rice. So each dot here represents a site with evidence of rice across Asia. So it includes East Asia, South Asia, and of course, Southeast Asia. And there were more than 400 sites included in the database. And this has now been recently updated to include many more. 
The colors in the map represent the chronology of the rice finds in order to determine which areas would have been the most probable centers of domestication. Now, the evidence for each of those dots in that, in that map um, uh, is basically a tabulation of whether the rice found in each of these sites was domesticated or wild. And in order to do that, archaeobotanists would have examined a rice plant part to see whether the rice shattered by itself, which would make it wild, as the picture shows up there. You can see a panicle with very few um, grains left because wild rice would shatter by itself, or whether human help was needed to detach the rice from the pedestal by threshing it which would make it domesticated. And you can see a picture on the right-hand side of domesticated rice. In order to do that, um, archaeobotanists look at the domestication status of rice by examining a particular part of the rice plant part. Uh, rice plant part. This is called the rice spikelet phase. And you can see the encircled image um, shows a spikelet base, which we consider domesticated type, which has a gouged out scar, which means that force would have been necessary to detach the rice spikelet from the pedestal. On the other hand, right next to it is a wild type uh, rice spikelet base, and it would have shown a smooth flat scar, which represents natural dehiscence in wild plants. So we try and look at how many domesticated type, how many wild type um, uh, rice spikelet bases we have in our assemblage and make a decision whether the status of rice in that particular site was domesticated or wild. Therefore, with all this data and using a model built by uh, Fabio da Silva, the model that best fits all available archeological evidence seem to have um, a dual origin model, wherein two centers for the cultivation and dispersal of rice focused on the middle and the lower Yangtze valleys for Japonica rices, and a much later origin of Indica that occurred in the, the Ganges or in South Asia. Um, however, what happens in Southeast Asia? Is the rice that we find in, in Southeast Asia coming from um, South Asia or is it coming from, from the North? Uh, also, is this uh, wet or dry land rice? So rice in prehistoric Southeast Asia is, um, when we find it archeologically, is charred most of the time, as I mentioned, and also quite deformed. Um, and one could take a look at the shape and potentially distinguish them as Japonica from Indica by just looking at the morphology, saying, if it's short and plump, then it's probably Japonica. If it's slender and long, it's probably Indica. However, it's a better idea to try and do morphometric studies in order to compare the, the prehistoric rice to metrics from modern Japonica and Indica rices. And we do this by measuring the length and the width. Um, the rice grain metrics suggest that the rice from the Neolithic, so we've got here on the bottom of my graph, several sites, uh, BNW is Banon Wat, KSK, Ka Sam Keo, PKT, Pu Kao Tong, uh, NUL, Nunu Look, and then we've got Non Ban Jack. And then we have later sites that belong to the historic period. So I've got Temangun, and, um, and basically we can see that when you compare this to the subspecies Japonica and Indica, the modern species, any rice length width ratio that falls under two would mean that it is Japonica type and anything that's higher than 2.2 would probably mean that they're Indicas. So as you can see in this slide, the prehistoric rices would normally veer towards the Japonica type and the historic rices veer towards the Indica type. So we know that the um, originally, the rice that would have entered Southeast Asia was uh, Japonica and not Indica. So a brief outline of rice in Southeast Asia shows that rice would have first arrived from either the North or the West, because we know that rice was cultivated or domesticated in, in China around 4,500 to 4,000 BC. 
Um, for some reason, I am not getting the dots that I'm supposed to get. I'm sorry about that. Let me just move forward because that does not make sense if you can't see it. Oh, there it is. Um, the first inferred rice cultivation happens in Bangchang and Bantaike. But the, the first time we have domesticated rice by looking at rice spikelet bases can be um, dated to 1500 BC in the site of Kok Panom D. We also have um, rice in Raknoi, the hunter gatherer site, wherein we have both foxtail millet and rice, but in very small quantities. And also, it is an area which doesn't really, um, uh, it's not conducive to doing rice agriculture or any kind of cereal agriculture. And so it has been interpreted as being imported. Um, the work done by Vince Piggott and um, this, the archaeobotanical study by Weber in central Thailand has also shown that domesticated rice was in place um, around 780 BC to 410 BC. And finally, we have many more sites appearing, such as Banan Wat, Khao Sam Keo, and Pukau Tong, um, where we have domesticated rice um, and also Japonica type rice, possibly tropical Japonica or Javanica, in these particular sites. And using the weed analysis, we can tell that it was dry land. So moving on to the next part of um, the talk, we look at um, the case study in Northeast Thailand, which one can say is a micro scale of not only what type of rice, but what the ecology of rice would have been by looking at the macro remains from two sites, um, Non Banjak and Banon Wat, which are 11 kilometers apart and are situated in the upper Moon River Valley, the Korat Plateau. Banon Wat and Non Banjak, um, basically had a lot of rice remains. So one could potentially um, study this to tell what the rice ecology and variety uh, was. So Banan Wat has, is a very important site in, in, in Southeast Asia because it has a very long chronological sequence and the cultural sequence spans from the Neolithic all the way to the Iron Age. So around 1600 BC to 600 AD. And it also has the most number of radiocarbon dates of any site in Southeast Asia. So originally the investigations by Charles Hyam were conducted in the uh, were burials, it was a cemetery, but then Nigel Chang also worked in other parts of Banan Wat, which, um, were, in, which were not part of the cemetery. It was also um, occupation areas. It has been well studied um, by many, many specialists. And non Banjak is uh, similarly been well studied by many specialists. It is another site in the Korat Plateau, also under the direction of Charles Hayam and Rachani Tosarat, as well as Nigel Chang. And it has more than 40 radiocarbon dates. And several field seasons have been conducted um, in, this, in this site. You can see Charles Hyam in the top uh, left-hand side, and you can see the scale of the, of the trench that was opened. And on the right-hand side, you can see the number of bags collected. These are just a few number of bags collected for um, flotation. And on the left middle side, you can see a store, a storeroom of um, probably of rice that was damaged by fire. And this particular uh, context basically only contained rice remains. <clears throat> so in order to understand rice cultivation systems, one must look at the weed seeds that act as a proxy as they grow in certain habitats um, together with the rice and are harvested at the same time making their way into the settlements. And eventually when these get thrown into a dump and they get, um, and they get burnt, these will make their way into the archaeobotanical assemblage. So a typical macro remains sample may look like the lower left-hand side image and is composed of not only economic crops like rice, but also wood, weeds, and a lot of unidentified remains. 
On the right hand side, you see a, a rice field with sedges growing alongside. And in this slide, um, I basically just want to point out that uh, we can identify through uh, archaeobotany the amazing weed diversity of rice in order to tell something about the ecology of rice. So I've got three uh, different weed species here, uh, Carazae lanica, which is green algae, uh, Cleome viscosa, and Acmela paniculata or paracress. Um, green algae grows in wet conditions, paracress or acmella paniculata grows in dryland conditions, and Cleome viscosa can be found in both types of ecological systems. Um, in this slide, I have several sites located um, in the northeast of Thailand, but we are mainly concentrating on Banon Wat and Non Ban Jack. Um, the dots symbolize the weeds that are associated with rice and whether they're wetland or dryland. So the blue dots are wetland and the red dots are dryland weeds of cultivation. Um, and on the right hand side, the paleoclimate reconstruction, which was done, done by Barbara Wolfarth at Lakes Kumpawapi and Paco, ad identifies a decline in the strength of the monsoon starting in the first millennium AD. And this leads to a sharp reduction in rainfall in the fifth century AD. So the driest point coincides with the moat constructions in the Korat Plateau or in the, in the upper Moon Valley river system. The archaeobotanical assemblage um, is also interesting because um, in this graph, I plotted the rice remains um, as well as the different weed seeds by ecology. So we've got a wetland weeds in blue, dryland weeds in, in orange, um, and the black is the rice from, are the rice remains. So the wheat images on the lower um, part of the slide are the most representative uh, of the weeds that were found in these sites. And the placrum, which is a sedge, is a wetland weed. And paracress, as I've shown you earlier, is, um, belongs to a dryland ecology. And again, what is interesting in this slide is that the Bronze Ages have predominantly dryland weeds of cultivation, whereas the Iron Age shows predominantly wetland weeds. However, there is a point in the early Iron Age where we all of a sudden start to see an increase in wetland weeds, although there is still a big proportion of dryland weeds as well. This happens in the early Iron Age 4.5, and I put an arrow there to show you. Now, going back to the main chart, we can therefore say that in the first century AD, we start to see a shift towards wetland rice farming. By the fourth century AD, the transition is pretty much complete. Um, and we now have wetland rice farming. So the three weed images that we now have on the screen uh, belong to the green algae and two sedges, uh, Fimbrisilis, which are normally found in irrigated wetland fields of rice. The pie charts, um, here represent the different chronological periods in the sites of Banon Wat and Non Ban Jack. And during the early Bronze Age, the weed assemblage is predominantly dry land. And this continues all the way to the late Bronze Age. Once we reach the early Iron Age, we now see a very high proportion of weeds that grow in both the weed, the wet and, um, and dry ecologies. And finally, in the late Iron Age, the weeds are mostly wetland weeds of cultivation. So um, we know that from the first century BC, conditions are gradually drying, um, drying off from the Neolithic to the Iron Age, it's, it's gradual. But once we get to the first century BC, the, condi the conditions get even drier. Um, this coincides with the period where we have a proliferation of moated sites and um, uh, another thing I want to point out is that the pie chart with the very big proportion of um, 
indeterminate weeds, which is the early Iron Age in Banon Wat. Um, indeterminate means that the weeds are probably occurring or are occurring in both wet and dry conditions. So maybe what is happening here is that there is mixed cultivation going on, which shows maybe some type of resilience coming from the people that were living here, wherein they're not, they've started to do wetland rice agriculture, haven't really stopped doing dryland agriculture and are just making sure that they cover all their bases by doing both types of agriculture. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so the construction of, um, what does this mean for, um, for uh, the area uh, in question? Well, there is a rise in social complexity wherein there is a construction of moats and reservoirs around the Iron Age settlements. It is also a period where we start to see um, iron plowshares and also the burial of iron sickles with dead. Weaponry and conflict are beginning to um, increase. We've got rice burials that show conspicuous wealth and a growing population, which can be seen through infant death, also meaning that there is a rise in fertility. The um, interesting thing about uh, plowshares is that we know that more land can be cultivated by plowing, um, but also when it comes to rice, now that we see that they are moving towards wetland rice agriculture, we also know that wetland rice production is more productive at least by two or three times uh, than dryland cultivation of rice. Um, so even if we take more time to prepare wetland um, fields for cultivating rice, um, it requires more man hour or labor hours than dryland cultivation systems, um, which is one of the reasons why we understand why um, people would choose to do dry land cultivation because it's, it, takes, it, it doesn't take as much labor input. However, they do spend a lot of time weeding. Um, the resulting yields from wetland rice cultivation makes the extra investment in labor worth it. However, let's not forget that wetland rice agriculture does have an environmental footprint um, with, in the sense that it produces methane. So, Almost twice as many human days are required in wetland rice cultivation systems, but it does yield three times um, more yields. So for part three, I will be talking about the key findings in, um, in um, the Khmer Empire. So uh, the work that I've been conducting there, there in collaboration with several uh, groups of people as well. Um, rice agriculture is linked to the emergence of empires, of which the Khmer Empire is one of the most well known. Angkor is famous for its massive stone temples. However, these temples are largely associated with Angkor's elite and royalty or, or, or kings. So from scholarship, which has concentrated mostly on um, these temples and the architecture of the Khmer, we have a lot of knowledge of the ruling classes. However, we don't know much about the common people. So what does archaeobotany say with respect to, to them? The Khmer Empire dominated much of mainland Southeast Asia, uh, especially from the 9th to the 15th centuries AD. And Angkor was the center for at least 500 years. So it has long chronology. It was well connected and there was a flow and exchange of economic resources into the capital. Um, the Khmer Empire also reached its um, zenith or maximum reach during the reign of Jayavarman VII. And he was known, best known for all his building efforts, including the Bayon and Taprom, as well as um, the Khmer road system, which um, Mitch Hendrickson has written quite a lot about. Um, the road system 
fulfilled certain roles, such, uh, certain functions like military and economic functions because it gave the Khmer access to um, resources. And here we've got um, the, the north, the road leading north to Pimai, wherein the Khmer probably obtained salt uh, from large mineral deposits in the northeast. It has uh, been documented by Zhao Dagan that the Khmer preferred uh, mountain salt to salt that came from the sea. Um, another road which leads to the east of Angkor is the, the Eastern Road, which leads to another resource, and that was iron. Um, it's also where Priya Khan of Kompong Savai, a very uh, extensive complex which had an important role in providing access to and distribution of iron. Um, and also right next to it is Phnom Dek, also known as the Iron Mountain, and it is the largest source of iron ore in Cambodia. So iron was used extensively in the construction of temples. Um, this is best exemplified by the iron crampons that um, stabilize the stone blocks in, in walls. And again, um, Hendrickson has uh, written extensively about this. So, <clears throat> so far, um, I have done macro remain studies in five sites. And uh, here I've got these sites and where they are located. So in the capital. So three sites are located in the Angkorian capital. So Angkor Wat, Taprom, and the Terrace of the Leopard King in Angkor Tom. The dates there do not signify the time when Angkor Wat was built, but these are the dates of what our archeological samples uh, span from. So in Angkor Wat, we've got samples that um, predate um, the building of Angkor Wat. So it's pre-Angkorian, Angkorian, and post-Angkorian. And likewise with Taprom. Um, Terrace of the Leopard King um, belongs to a post-Angkorian period. And then uh, the peripheral sites were Priya Khan and Kompong Savai, um, as well as Ton Le Bac. It was uh, Priya Khan of Kompong Savai is a, is a place that was occupied possibly by regional elites um, and Ton Le Bac was an iron working area. So one of the benefits of working in the Angkorian period or in, in Cambodia is that you have some benefits compared to the prehistoric period. Um, what I mean by this is that we actually have um, different sources uh, other than archaeology that we can refer to in order to understand the plants that are being used by the Khmer. So there are many more sources to dip into, for example, inscriptions. Um, which you can see a picture there on the right hand side, uh, architecture, sculptures and reliefs. And here I want to point out that in this relief sculpture, we can see a toddy palm, which is representative of, um, you find these everywhere in Cambodia and Dan Penny has written about the importance of uh, toddy palms. Um, uh, we also have written accounts, in particular, one very important one by Zhe Dugan, who was a Chinese emissary to Angkor, dating to 1296 to 97. And finally, of course, we've got archaeology. So um, all these can be used in conjunction with your um, macro botanical data. So um, the nice thing about the Khmer inscriptions from the Angkorian period is that they um, also describe the lives of thousands of non-elites involved in daily functions. Um, in the temples, from religious specialists uh, to the communities that were living around the temples and probably uh, used as labor in the temple operations. And in this slide, uh, I show the number of times a plant product found in my archibotanical studies are mentioned in three particular inscriptions. I've only used three inscriptions, of course, there are many more. But what this illustrates is the centrality of rice in the epigraphic record, as well as the importance of other crops. Um, the uh, Angkorian um, Khmer inscriptions are important sources of information. 
And um, here we can see that rice is more is mentioned more times in at least two inscriptions than all the other plant remains. But cotton and mung bean are equally important. Um, they were rice was particularly important for taxation as well as ritual and also um, uh, barter. And the written records, um, in particular, the account by Jadugan provides many insights about the lives of the Khmer, including things like um, backstrap, the use of the backstrap loom, wherein the Cambodians uh, knew how to weave cotton, but apparently they did not use a loom, but rather a backstrap loom. Uh, Tree cotton or Josipium arboretum, ar arboreum, that's sorry, that's a mistake, it's arboreum, um, where he mentions that cotton trees grew taller than houses, which makes us believe that it's probably um, the Josipium arboreum, which comes from South Asia. And finally, um, uh, long pepper, wherein he describes a twisting vine, a kind of pepper with twisting vine that forms clusters like wild hops, which is probably, again, long pepper. Um, and looking at the number of economic plants identified in each of the sites, we find that Angkor Wat um, has, is more diverse and has at least 15 different taxa compared to the other four sites. Um, this is closely followed by, well, this is followed by Priya Khan of Kompong Savai and the Terrace of the Leper King. I exclude the Terrace of the Leper King in these discussions because most of the taxa that was found, the variety of taxa and the Terrace of the Leper King were part of a ritual deposit. Um, so you can't really talk about um, diets and, and garden or horticulture. Um, I would expect Angkor Wat to have a very high um, diversity because of the flow of goods from um, agricultural surplus and taxation into the Angkorian center. However, this does not explain why Taprom, which is also in the center, has such low diversity. Um, what I th think is happening in Taprom is that they were basically engaged in that particular um, trench, which was excavated was probably representative of one thing, and that was that there was cotton processing and textile production happening in that particular site. Um, and so we have cotton, which is outnumbering plant remain, which outnumbers rice in Taprom. On the other hand, Priya Khan of Kompong Sabai has very high diversity as well, because it was a regional center and was well connected to the capital and, and uh, probably played an important role in the flow of goods. Um, besides the taxa diversity, what is interesting to note is the proportion of economic crops in each of the sites. So um, please note that Tonle Bac has foxtail millet incorporated in, in the um, assemblage, which was not found in any of the other three sites. Um, except maybe the site in Angkor Thom did have foxtail millet, but it was part of the ritual deposit again. Angkor Wat does not only have the highest taxa diversity, but also the consumption of economic crops is not concentrated on just rice alone, unlike at Thom Le Bac, which is really predominantly rice. Um, there seems to be a more varied diet in Angkor Wat, uh, at least looking at what's going on in the plant remains there. And then there are similarities in all the sites wherein there is a prevalence of specific plant remains. So we've got rice, we've got mung beans, um, and or, which is represented by black as pulses. And we have cotton, which is represented by the blue as cash crops. So the presence of rice in all these sites and that of mung beans to a lesser extent um, indicates that these crops were the basis of the Khmer diet. The construction of, I will talk about Angkor Wat briefly, and that will be the only site that I will concentrate on because we don't have a lot of time. Um, but basically the construction of the temple of Angkor Wat dates to the 12th century AD, during the reign of Suyavarman II. Um, 
grid, here we have a grid map of the Angkor Wat and Eastern Enclosure areas uh, during the gap fieldwork, which was superimposed on the LiDAR digital terrain model, which was drawn by uh, uh, Pipal Heng. Excavations took place in 2013 and 2015 in occupation areas and household contexts around the temple. So we were, so the, the group, the gap project, which was spearheaded by um, Alison Carter and Miriam Stark, basically were looking at uh, residential areas more than anything else. Um, the, the pie chart here shows um, the macro remain as assemblage at Angkor Wat, which you've seen earlier. Um, and what we can tell is the proportion of plants found in Angkor in all phases. So I did in this particular pie chart, I'm not differentiating by face. There is a difference by face, but I won't get into it right now. Um, and what is interesting here is that the um, big proportion of other economic crops, uh, which is bigger than the rice remains, shows how many other different types of um, crops were being um, consumed and maybe cultivated around Angkor Wat in the residential area. So you've got things like scarlet banana, crepe ginger, long pepper, um, uh, a type of um, same family as okra, Indian gooseberry, then you've got uh, tree cotton, um, artocarpus, which you will all know from jackfruit. It would be the artocarpus that you would basically be familiar with. And then you've got um, mung bean there. So the phytolith analysis, which was conducted in Angkor Wat and Taprom by two colleagues of mine, um, Ellie uh, Kingwell Banham and Alison Weiskopf, who's no longer actually with us, um, was is also really, really interesting because it complements the macro remains. So there were volcaniforms, um, which basically show uh, a shape like a volcano, and you can see in letter G over there, as well as A. Uh, these are um, phytoliths that you will, that are abundant in banana leaves. Um, there's there is some rice um, uh, phytoliths, although very very little was represented. There was only one context with rice. Echinates from palm leaves such as areca coconuts or toddy palms and you can see that in letter e and f um, and what it basically uh, says is that it complements very much so with the macro remains wherein we also did find some evidence of um, of musa or or bananas and um, this probably indicates that they were planted in home gardens because that's what everybody does in Southeast Asia, they're planted in home gardens, but also that the leaves are being used. Um, there was a purpose for, for the leaves and leaves are used for wrappers or animal fodder and perhaps also in a ritual setting as well. Um, and in this picture, you can see Alison over there, Alison Weisskopf. I went on field work with Alison um, to Mei Hong Son province and we stayed with the White Karen uh, group and we took a look at what they were growing in their gardens. And we plot, we took down the names of what they were actually cultivating in the gardens. So um, it is important to use modern references or ethnographic accounts as well, which is what we were doing here. I don't have a good picture of a Cambodian garden. So that's why I'm using this one for today. But, <clears throat> What it shows here is that people do plant all types of um, plants in their, in, which are of economic use. So here you've got black pepper in the background as well as mango. Um, there's gingers there. There's a banana tree, uh, sorry, banana plant. Um, there, there, the man is holding sugar cane. There are legumes um, in the foreground. And also it's a very, very weedy garden but um, it does show you a typical garden in Southeast Asia. 
Furthermore, um, some of the ethnographic accounts like the one by Clovis Thorell, um, when he went along the Mekong Basin mentions plants found in gardens. And some of these are represented in the archeological deposits of the five sites that I have studied. So in conclusion, I just want to say that um, in conclusion, the archaeobotanical contribution to the world of Angkor is that um, the samples, especially because of the kind of work that um, Miriam Sark and Alison Carter have been conducting, um, which were derived from, the, from, the, from areas where the non-elite would have lived, is that we now can help reconstruct some of those aspects um, of the lives of the non-elites living within temple structures. Also, um, macro remains, um, inscriptions, and writ the written account by Jean Dogan shows how important rice was for the Khmer, whether it was daily life, ritual, or community. Um, but we shouldn't forget that there were other um, there were other staples and there were other mac um, plants that were equally important, such as pulses and or mung beans, for example, as well as uh, millets. And we have um, a good representation of plants that were grown in home gardens, but also crops that were being brought from elsewhere. So rice would have been brought in from elsewhere, but food items would have been grown in gardens um, around um, uh, the temple area. And I'd like to acknowledge all my collaborators, because like I said, uh, the work I do isn't possible without so many people that I work with. And finally, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Um, Arvin, take it away. All right. Uh, um, if anybody has any questions, you can either put them in the chat box or you can um, just read the, or, and I can read them out loud or you can just uh, um, unmute, unmute your mic and turn on your camera. Good. A question, yes. Arvin? Yes. Uh, Christina, thank you so much for a wonderful, fascinating talk. Um, I, I, I was struck by not only the methodologies and how effective they can be in answering so many different kinds of questions, reconstruct these cultures and histories, uh, but also the, the, the kinds of nuanced questions we might approach as well. And I was, I was very interested in this idea of, of rice plus, and I was wondering, if some of the evidence might show um, sort of state kinds of policies that might be related to changes in the landscape and changes in strategies for, for either procuring or producing food, whether it's from far away or produced locally. Um, and I, this may be a very ignorant question, but in terms of some of the genetic uh, features for plants like rice or others, do we see any evidence or is it even possible to see genetic changes that may be introduced during the lifespan of the empire? And if so, would that suggest that potentially there are experiments or there are various kinds of cultural choices being made to promote certain kinds of features as we see other changes that might be happening throughout the, the, the society? Hmm. Tough question actually, because um, <laughs> It would be very difficult to see genetic changes per se, because that would mean that you have to do ancient DNA, which hasn't really been so uh, successful. Um, however, yes, I think you can see that there are different varieties of rice that are being cultivated. Um, I still haven't managed to figure out whether I haven't been able to disentangle um, the rices in each of the sites on whether they are of different varieties. But we, I do know for a fact that I am getting at least two varieties. I'm getting indica and japonicas in terms of the morphology, the morphometrics. That's what I'm getting. Now, I think that 
one of the things that I need to do moving forward is try to see if in the peripheral areas, for example, you're getting different kinds of, of rice, um, which are more um, of, I don't know, Indica or Japonica. And if in the center, it's one particular kind, or if you're having different types of rice coming in. The other thing I can say is that um, I think in Angkor, for example, in the capital, at least you are getting um, rice from many areas because that's what their taxation program is. They, they, so you will have a variety of rice and they're probably going to come from many different kinds of ecological systems. So you're going to get it from dry land systems as well as wetland. But disentangling that is very, very difficult in the archeological record. Right. Um, especially because we don't really know where exactly that rice is coming from. So the answers of whether there are changes in what the central powers are um, making happen, I, I cannot answer that with the archaeobotany as it stands. Maybe in the future, I think a lot more work has to be done. I mean, you have to remember, I've only worked so far in five sites in Cambodia. It's the first time that, um, because really it was because of Miriam Stark who actually invited me to, to start working in Cambodia that we actually now have macro remains. There has been quite a lot of um, palynology done, but that answers different questions, so. Okay, thank you. You're thank welcome. You. Actually, I, Arvin, may I ask a second follow-up? Absolutely, yeah? absolutely. Okay, um, so in, in sort of keeping with, with this idea of Rice Plus and changes that might be happening over time, do you see any indications of changes in the suite of, of crops mm. that may correspond to different historical periods, like changes in religious practices, for instance? Is, is that <laughs> Again, even... your presses are tough. No? Okay, okay. If you don't see it, then it's fine. I was just curious. No, no, um, no, no. I think, okay, I will not put religious practices into place because um, that is, again, disentangling something, but different chronologies, definitely. You can really see a change in the suite of maybe not so much the plants. Yeah, no, actually the plants, but also the proportion of how much of those plants are being consumed. So I have not presented that, but um, one of the things that we definitely see in Angkor Wat is that during the period of uh, construction, you have more, a higher proportion of rice remains yeah. compared to the period of occupation. Okay. Could it be because people are working on site and eating and yeah, yeah, yeah. rice is a staple, so you will get more abundance of that. And then, of course, you, you, then you see that it has, um, as, as time progresses, you have more of a variety of other plants. And maybe when they are living in the area, they have the home gardens. Mm -hmm. And so they're getting the economic crops from the home garden. So they're not getting every single crop from their, from their gardens, but they're definitely getting a lot of it from, from the gardens. So maybe that's why you see a larger suite of crops when it's occupied. And before that, you see more rice. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, okay, we have a question from Allison Carter. Uh, she says, thanks so much for this presentation. Christina's work has been foundational to the work we've been doing in Angkorian residential spaces. My question, given your 15 years of work in, in SEA, so far, so far, what do you think about where the field is could or should go in the future? Are there spaces slash places slash time periods that are understudied? Particular research uh, uh, questions that you would like to focus on uh, going forward? Thanks, Alison. Um, and thanks for having me work with you because it's been, uh, it's been answered a lot of questions. So now we've got a lot of prehistoric uh, periods covered, um, not enough, I would say. And now we also have um, a bit of pre-Ankorian, Ankorian periods and post-Ankorian periods studied, but not enough again, I would say. So we do have a big gap in the middle. So in Thailand, for example, the Varavati period, we don't really have sites dating to, to, to that period. So we don't really know exactly how Okay, so one of the big things that I focus on is rice. And we know that the Chinese originated um, subspecies, Japonica, was the first type of rice that made it down to Southeast Asia. We also know that right now in um, 
in mainland Southeast Asia, the cultivation of uh, in lowland areas is indica rice, which is the Indian originated rice. But when exactly does the Indian rice make it to Southeast Asia is still a question that we haven't managed to answer because we don't have that crucial period where we see the changes. Um, so when we start getting Indian, uh, big Indian contact between mainland Southeast Asia and South Asia, they bring a lot of things with them. They bring the mung beans, they bring uh, kajanas, pigeon pea, they bring uh, cotton, but not rice. Uh, because rice is already established in mainland Southeast Asia. So it doesn't happen within that first period of time when the, when the contacts are, are, are in place. It happens over a longer period of time. So that is something that I think needs to be studied. Now, what could we do in the future? Um, well, we've got uh, one of the uh, people listening in this talk is a, a young lady called Jo. Um, who is Thai and she's an archaeobotanist and I have high hopes that she's going to go and start working in uh, Thailand again and in Southeast Asia. We need more archaeobotanists and more archaeobotany so that we can actually have a better picture of what's going on. Um, we don't have that many. Um, uh, I think Jade has now started working in Thailand, in central Thailand, Jade Alpuam Guedes, but that's basically it for macro remains specialists. We've got Dan Penny who works in phalaenology and phytoliths, we've got very few. So I think we need more archaeobotanists. So I hope that answers the question. Um, uh, Alison Carter says, thank you. <laughs> um, does anybody have any other questions? Is everyone hungry? <laughs> <laughs> Presumably, especially after all this rice talk. <laughs> we have many thanks in the chat thank box. You. Yeah, thank um, you. Catherine Trotter, thank you again for the wonderful talk. Unfortunately, I need to get going. And then um, uh, Miriam says, big thanks to UW Madison, Wisconsin for hosting this talk and to Christina for a wonderful synthesis of your work. Here's hoping that we can revisit this lecture in a decade with far more samples. And apologize, she apologizes for having to leave. We've, oh, we've got some more, yeah, many thanks rolling in. So um, yeah. I think you can see those in the chat box and uh, we'd give you a big virtual hand for um, a terrific talk. Thank and you. Don't miss next week's talk by Nick Cheeseman for our series. I don't believe archaeology has one next week, but then we both have one again uh, by Laura Juncker on the 30th. So please, please join us for that one. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Castillo. I really Thank enjoyed the talk. I, I really did. And if um, I should have put my email, but I'm easy to find, I think, uh, if anybody needs anything or has questions on the side, please contact me. I'll be very happy to help. Definitely. Thank you. Definitely. Good luck with your work, all of you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, Christina. Thanks, Nam. Actually, I, I was going to ask you another question, but uh, I think sure. we're running out of time. But um, I, I was just curious about some of the burials and if we have evidence of rice being included as part of the burial offerings. Yeah. Definitely. In Northeast Thailand, a lot of um, burials that come from the late Iron Age, so in Banunwat, in Nonbanjak, in Nunuluk, they buried their dead with rice. So they, they're called the rice burials. And yeah. um, they become um, silicified. So the rice is not charred. So you, you get it, it becomes white. I, I think I showed a picture of it. It was, I didn't make it very clear, but yes rice burials do happen regularly. And yeah. does that change with, with the, the, the emergence of the, the empire or those practices continue suppose, in some of these local areas? I suppose they do. I mean, I haven't encountered any rice burials in pre-Ankorian or Ankorian period um, yeah. work. Okay. So yeah, I'm assuming it does, be, you know, because of the way you inter your dead, yeah. you know, your Buddhist or your Hindu, you wouldn't. Um, and I, I 
that one image that you showed for Num Numbon Jack? Yeah. Was, was there, so I think you said it was a storeroom or a store oh, storage yeah. facility. Was, was there an artifact of bronze? Yep. No, it was uh, ceramics. Oh, it was ceramic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But basically, it's a big, you can see a big hole and it's black. And that okay. hole was where all the rice remains were taken from. I see. And it was just chock full of rice remains. Okay. The whole thing was, I had nothing else. I had rice in that particular store. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. a room, it was a store. A store. Okay. Fascinating. <laughs> Great. I, I don't want to dominate the conversation if others have anything. And I don't want to keep you too long. I know it's probably getting late for you. Yeah. Oh, no, it's okay. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, Arvin, I don't know if anyone else has any comments. Does any, yeah, does anybody else have any questions? I guess not. Um, 